Greetings, my name's Adam Draycott, and you are watching the online ministry from Inverell Anglican Church. Uh, it's great to be sharing this time with you. Uh, this has been prepared for the 12th of November, 2023, Ordinary Sunday number 30. And our sentence of scripture uh, comes from Psalm 105. It says, Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Well, let's enter into a time of praise where we rejoice in the Lord. Our collect prayer. Almighty and eternal God, strengthen our faith, hope and love. Make us love what you command. 
that we might enter more fully the life that you promise. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, as we come to the ministry of God's Word, our Bible readings today come from Psalm 103, verses 1 to 12, and Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Let me open this time together in prayer. Our loving Father, uh, we need your help. We pray that you would um, open the eyes of our hearts, that we might see your word, that see you more clearly, um, see that our need for Jesus, that you'd be growing us in our faith and that you'd be glorified. Father, we pray that in this time we would use it well that you'd be work, at work in our hearts by your Spirit. We pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. G'day, how's life rolling for you? Bit up and down? Could be easier? I mean, if life was a little different, a little better, it would make all the difference, right? But what would it take? More rain? An injection of cash? Couple of scanners? A new relationship? I know, retail therapy. See, what is required to bring about the better you? The healthier you? The happier you. What if I was able to offer you something that could make your life better, would make your life better? Something that might just make all the difference in the world. Big promise. In our passage, here is Paul. The Apostle Paul is in prison. And he is a long way away and he's on his knees as he enters into the presence of God in prayer. And what does he what does he think is going to change things for him? Well let's have a look in verse 14. For this reason and we ask for what reason? Uh, he's referring to all the work Christ has done to bring about his church. Verse 6, in the gospel, Gentiles and Israel are heirs, one body, sharing the same promise. He's in jail, and this is what Paul is thinking about. Because of Christ... Now he and his fellow believers can approach God with freedom and confidence. And so verse 14 again. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. How are we to understand the fatherhood of God? Well, I think in verse 3... Paul has already helped us. See, praise be to the God and Father of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so how are we then brought into God's family? Look at verse 5. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Some ask, aren't we all God's children? Well, John chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 are instructive for us. It says that he, Jesus, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Do you see it? What is our response to Jesus? Have you received him? Do you believe in him? Are you now part of God's family in Christ? I mean, I love the tie here at Inverell. The waiter knows me. But he smiles because he already knows what I'm going to order. Sometimes he gets a surprise, but he knows I keep coming back for more and more. And for the Christian, coming to Christ is not just a one-off experience. No. Once we've tasted Christ's love and kindness, we don't just keep coming back. We cannot separate ourselves, such as his love. It would be unthinkable. Here is where we find ourselves. One's name is one's identity. Here is your true family identity. God is your adoptive father. You are his adopted child. Therefore, we are Christians because we are in Christ. So it drives Paul to his knees. What does he pray? Well, look at verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, and on he goes. We'll come to that in a moment. Some Christians think that you get Christ... And then later on in life, you get a second blessing of the Spirit. Nah, that's not what we read here. Equally, it's not like you get the Spirit and then you get Christ. Nah. Read these verses and see the work of the Spirit. And see the work of Christ and see that they run parallel. It's very Trinitarian. It's all of God's work together. That word inner being is the place where we do all our thinking. It's the center of our identity, our personality, our thoughts, our wills, emotions, and whatever else is seated there. It's our souls. Our inner being is like our hearts. And the prayer is that God would strengthen us by his spirit, in our inner being, in our heart, I think. And the prayer is also that Christ may dwell there too, in our hearts, by faith. We need to think about it. By the spirit of God, the presence of Jesus, the one who is Lord of all, takes chief place and residence in our hearts. And so do we see why Paul prays for such strengthening? I mean, Christmas is around the corner. If we are amazed that the baby in a manger could contain and hold and be the Lord of creation, it should be even more amazing to us that Christ himself comes to dwell in us. Love divine, come down into here. I mean, if you remember chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, this is the Lord who's described as, verse 21, far above all rule and authority, dominion and power, the Father's Son, the one whom the heavens cannot contain, the mighty Lord, the one from whom every name uh, is invoked, the one appointed head over everything. He, the King, comes to dwell in weak and sinful mortals like me and you. See, how can we take in the magnitude of that? The prayer is that Christ would permeate the very depths of our being, that Jesus would not be an optional extra or just a crutch, not an accessory, not a passing phase or an occasional interest, not something peripheral, 
but that he that we would experience Jesus ruling as king living and shining out of our hearts in a full and real and personal way because this is where he dwells and so again little wonder Paul prays that God would strengthen us by his Holy Spirit. We need God to be preparing us by his Spirit, strengthening us in our weaknesses, um, evacuating sin, right? Clearing out the garbage, yes. And as that happens, it, making more room for King Jesus, yes. And it is all of God's work together. So friends, we cannot be untouched by this. This is a great prayer. And of course, you know, I'm going to ask, do you pray like this? Do I pray like this? That Christ himself would be the centerpiece of our lives and the centerpiece of the lives of others. It's a prayer that goes like this. More Jesus, please. Simple as that. More Jesus, please. And isn't this how life can be better? I mean, if we remember last week, don't we want every blessing under the sun that God our Father has for us and for our fellow believers? Don't we want to be filled with a full measure of God? Not just to know it up here in our heads, but to experience this in our hearts our emotions, our souls. Here it is. Christ makes your heart his home. Here is the better life. The better life. Or maybe the better life is concerned with your circumstances, your comforts, your ambitions, your appearance, your wants, your needs. If living with Jesus is really the better way, and I think it is, then are we praying that the Lord would take front and centre place in our life? That he would steer our day? And centre peace, centre place in the lives of others. Matthew 6, 33, this is what Jesus says. And this is about priorities. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will take care of itself. That's Adam's paraphrase. You probably picked that. But do we reverse it when we pray? We pray about everything else. We count our problems again, our priorities. And then maybe we get to the Jesus stuff, the kingdom of God stuff. I think we might be tempted to pray. We move from small and then maybe we get to the big stuff. But I want to say, friends, if we start with the big stuff, we'll always get to the small. As we pray, as we start with Jesus and his gospel, if we start with a big picture of God and his love and his goodness and his grace, well, we'll always get to the immediate personal stuff that touches us in the here and now. And so here is the invitation. When you pray, go big as a kingdom person. And this is what works according to Jesus. Here is the key to a better life. Keep the king, King Jesus central. More Jesus, please. That's the prayer. Right, here's the second thing he prays. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 17. B, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Here is the thing he prays for, love. It's being anchored and rooted and grounded in love, that the Ephesians may, be fur may further be able to grasp and comprehend the vastness of God's love in Christ. I mean, seriously, who would want that? I mean, we read this, I wonder, is it gardening language? The love of God in Christ? 
is the soil in which Christians are to be rooted and to grow with the nutrients and nourishment and all that makes us strong Christians comes up from the soil. Christ's love. We are to be rooted in it. And think of the biggest tree that you've ever seen. Maybe it's the Kauri Forest in New Zealand. Think about how high it is, but how often is the height of a tree matched by its depth, which is, which are its, its roots. That's right. How high and how deep. And just as a tree gets its needs from the soil and moisture and chemicals and the like, its needs are met by the roots and drawn up through the trunk and into the branches and leaves. But the roots are the anchor. Big tree, big roots, remember. And if the roots are unhealthy, then the whole tree is at risk, which means it can still look fairly okay above the ground, big and sprawling for a time on the outside, but underneath, below the surface, we know there are problems. It's becoming unstable and it's ready to fall with a crash. So too the Christian. Hear the encouragement. Do your roots run down deep in the love of Christ such that you might lose the occasional branches and leaves. You might experience the occasional storm, but you remain steadfast and true and anchored in the love of Christ. Or does it all look good on the outside? but you're just one strong wind away from toppling down. Is that you? Where are your roots? Is Christ central? Do you know him personally? You're living with him daily. Are you anchored in his love? Because this isn't just head knowledge. This isn't simply just knowing about stuff because we're limited anyway in what we can know. No, Paul encourages his readers to go beyond head knowledge, to go beyond knowing about Jesus and actually experience him and enjoy him and walk with him as our personal friend and saviour and king. And friends, this is the love that surpasses knowledge. See, is it Christ's love for you that nurtures you and feeds you and sustains you and it helps you to grow as a Christian, that you be more like Jesus himself? Are we praying that God's fullness would fill us, that we might be so indwelled by the Lord, filled to capacity, filled with the Spirit, and therefore filled with God's love, such that we're oozing Jesus? that Jesus is manifest in us. That is, he is surely the light of the world. His words are true. You are the light of the world too. Because we're showing Jesus. Now think, is it possible, Paul is telling the Ephesian church not to be complacent? Because they are going well. You can see that in chapter 1. But maybe their understanding of Christ and his love isn't really nearly big enough. Could that, and if that is true for them, could that be true for us? That our understanding of Christ and his love is not nearly big enough. Could that be true? Sobering thought. The correction is, well, it's a mistake to think that we've somehow ever arrived. Who would ever say that? That we've got it all worked out and that we've learned it all and we know it all. It's a mistake to be complacent, to think that somehow we've grown enough or we're mature enough, or that we don't need to change. So here's the thing. How different might my life be if I understood Christ's love for me and for you even just a little bit better? How different would my life be if I was to grow a little more in Christ's love for me? How different would your life be 
if you were to grow a little bit more in this love? How different would church be if we all grew just a little bit more in the love of Christ as a family? How different would our prayers be? How different would our commitment to church be? Or our giving, our acts of service, our attitude to sin and holiness, our care for the needy, and our concern for the lost in our community. If we could grasp Christ's love for us, even just a little bit more, would that not change everything? We want to keep growing, don't we? Because we all know we're a work in progress. No one would not not say that. And so we keep looking to Jesus and we keep trying to comprehend more and more the magnitude of his love for us. And we do it together. We do it under God and we ask him. We ask him, Father, give us more of your son, Jesus. I mean, he gave everything on the cross. Uh, absolutely 100%. Give us more, give us more about your Saviour because our Saviour has even more to give. We want to know him better. And so to grow in Christ changes everything. So let us pray to that end. Here's the last thing, verse 20 onwards. Uh, as you read that, look, know that God can do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. Right? It's a question, how big is your God? It's like God, I read this and I go, it's like God is saying to me, hey, Draycott, don't you know how big I am? Don't you know how great my love is? If my love for you is so great and you know that and you're experiencing that, Adam, why aren't you asking me about dot, dot, dot? Adam, why are you relying on your own strength when, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Heavenly Father. I, I've got strength and power. Why aren't you asking me? Adam, why do you worry so much about your kids and their walk? Do you worry about your mum? Or you worry about your staff and your church family you worry about? And you hope life is going to get better somehow. You hope for more better days and less bad days. But Adam, why aren't you asking me? I am your father. You are my child. See my love for you in the sun. Why try to plough through life's rubbish all by yourself? Adam, life can be so much better. I want better things for you. Don't tell me you're too busy. Check your screen time. Adam, you don't have to do this alone. I am your heavenly father. My son makes his home in you. And all I want to do is bless you with the enormity of my love for you and the enormity of my love for the saints in Inverell or Ashford or Delungra or Emmerville or Deepwater or wherever you are. All I want to do is bless you and your relationships, your marriage, your children, your workplaces by putting my son at the centre of your life continually, that you wouldn't just know him, that you would experience him more and more, more of Jesus. you just got to ask, because God can do immeasurably more than, than you can ever imagine. Let me pray. Father God, we come before you. And we pray that out of your glorious riches, you may, you may strengthen us with power through your spirit. Strengthen us in our inner being so that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith. Father, we pray that we would be rooted and established in love. That we would have the ability, the power, along with all of your people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And Father, not just to know it, but that we would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, that this head knowledge would become heart knowledge, 
that it will be part of our daily experience. Father, we come to you and we acknowledge that you are able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And so, Father, to you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. sisters we've just talked about an excellent example of prayer let me encourage you to be brave and to use it as a model give it a go and maybe uh, may you find that a rich experience it's a great thing to come to the heavenly father and ask him to reveal more and more of his love for us in jesus that it would touch our hearts and be part of our daily experience that we would grow in Christ. So pray to that end. Also, there's a blue screen, some suggestions, of course. Um, we have our needs and we are right to bring our needs before the Heavenly Father as well. 
Uh, but remember the encouragement. Whatever you do, don't not pray. You've got it. Let's pray. Let me close with the words of the blessing that come from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations 
forever and ever. Amen. God bless everybody.